It's me again. I'm sorry to interrupt all of the exciting and productive conversation among the uh, junior and senior scholars in our field in this room. However, we do regrettably have programming for the lunch session. You will be learning things during the lunch session as well. Um, over the years at, at the Scholars Program, we've tried to make the lunch session um, especially informal, especially friendly, and focus really on the, the overt concerns of junior scholars about how do I get from point A to point B. And we've, we've historically been telling that story through, um, through personal stories, really, personal stories of success, personal stories of uh, missteps and recoveries. And um, you know, for the, we, we've been hearing a lot about sort of the roots and the philosophies that underlie a successful uh, career in anesthesiology science. Now, um, hopefully, these two speakers will take us through some of the twists and turns of their own career um, and give us some unvarnished truths of implementing that advice and how it might look. So uh, first I'd like to introduce Julie Freed. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And uh, she's going to talk to, her, uh, to us about some of the unique challenges and her experience as a physician scientist in the uh, early part of her career. So let's welcome Julie Freed. All right, Liz, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're having a great day so far. I personally think this is the most important day for our specialty, right, because we're focusing on you. We're focusing on the future innovators in our specialty, and whether that's in basic science, clinical research, translational research, outcomes, quality improvement, education, whatever it is, right, hopefully we're all going to be moving our specialty forward. But as you can pretty much heard from this morning, that's a difficult career to have. And there's a lot of roadblocks and kind of situations and issues you might run into along the way that you have to overcome. And that's kind of been actually a theme already this morning. So what I'm going to do is kind of talk to you about, you know, I've been doing this for nine months now, so I have a you know, great experience as a faculty member. But I can tell you about some of the things that I've had to deal with already, and, and it's OK. Uh, so I know this is a little bit of a cliche, right? I have a picture up here of a woman about to start the 100 meter high hurdle race. But it's true, right? Again, we're always trying to you know, attack the next problem, overcome obstacles. And this really means a lot to me because I was a hurdler. I ran for the University of Minnesota. And I feel like the hurdles I'm running into today are a little bit more challenging than what I did in college. So first off, just a little bit about my background. So as Liz said, I'm from the Medical College of Wisconsin. So just to kind of tell you about us and where we are, so in case you don't know where you are right now, we're in Chicago. It's a great city. If you go about 80 miles north of that along the lake, you end up in beautiful Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And that's home to the Milwaukee Regional Medical Center and the Medical College of Wisconsin, or MCW. Um, not to get us confused, I have to explain to people sometimes, but to the west of us, 80 miles west, is the University of Wisconsin. And just because we're in Chicago, I have to point out that if you go two hours north, it's home to the greatest football team in history. So <laughs> I had to say that. So I love Wisconsin. Yes, yeah, 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 okay. Okay, yeah. So I, I love Wisconsin. It's one of the most beautiful states. The people are extremely genuine and nice, and I'm very lucky to, to be there. And I have to say that also because I've spent a lot of time at MCW. I did all my training at MCW. In fact, this morning, if you were at the Selden Lecture, somebody was referred to as a, a 4V, like they did all their training there. I'm like a 5M, OK? So uh, this is just 14 years of training on one slide. I started out as a researcher. So uh, in 2003, I started my PhD in cardiovascular physiology. I love cardiac physiology. Um, and then you'll kind of see maybe a few slides later why I made this decision. But after graduate school, I went on to medical school and just stayed at MCW for that. And then after medical school, uh, I stayed on to do my anesthesiology residency there. I had a couple unique opportunities, which I'll talk about. But one was to go on our NIH T32 training grant. And it was a really cool experience because I extended my residency by a year and I was allowed to do five months of research and then seven months of clinical and I basically flip-flopped back and forth for five years. Uh, and then I stayed on for an extra year because what's another year of training as we talked about this morning for my, my uh, cardiac anesthesia fellowship. 
And during my fellowship, I spent one day a week in the lab, uh, basically putting together preliminary data and assembling all my grants. In 2013, in July, I became an assistant professor, also at MCW, and received my first grant, which, thank you, FAIR, was a FAIR MRTG. And now we're in 2018, and well, who knows what the year is going to bring. Uh, so the other opportunity that I had and why I've spent so much time at MCW was really because of this man here. This is David Gutterman. He's a cardiologist by training, and he is a world expert in the human microcirculation. So when I was thinking about, okay, you know, I want to go into anesthesia, I obviously picked the greatest specialty you could choose, uh, but what are kind of the, the problems that are going to be facing our specialty in the future? And I have to be honest with you, at the time I struggled because we're always being told how safe anesthesia is. Oh, it's so safe, it's fine. But the, popula the population's changing, right? Our patient demographics are changing. People are getting sicker. And that really kind of made me think about, okay, we have the obesity epidemic, we have the aging population, we're going to see a huge increase in the incidence of cancer by 2030. All these charts are going to be skyrocketing. In fact, ask yourself where all the young scholars, where we're going to be in 2030, we'll be taking care of these patients. And all of these things lead to vascular inflammation and dysfunction. And so my goal was to work with David and have him teach me everything he knows, and he's an outstanding mentor. I want to be David Gutterman basically someday, and, and take that and apply it to our specialty. That was the goal. And I really felt lucky because during my training, my chair was David Waltier. And in fact, Liz showed an article this morning during the introduction that he wrote. He was such a huge, and still is, a huge advocate of physician scientists. So here I was during my training thinking, oh, this is great. My plan is just, one, you know, it's wonderful. I got both Davids by my side. I've got someone who's going to teach me everything about how to be a translational researcher. Um, I've got David Waltier who's going to invest in me. Everything's great. So I stayed on. I signed a contract about a year before I started. And then Dave Waltier announces his retirement. So as you can imagine, there was a little bit of panic. And I'm telling you right now, these things are going to happen throughout your career, unfortunately, right? People leave institutions, people retire, whether it's your chair, uh, your mentor, right? Things are going to happen. And again, I was freaking out a little bit. And to me, I felt like I hit a hurdle. I didn't know what was going to happen. Who is going to be our next chair? Are they going to support research, education? Where is our department going to go? Well, I was lucky. So Dr. Cindy Lean became our next chair. And it turns out she's a huge supporter of education and research. She believes in me and my career goals. And that's incredibly, incredibly important. So now I'm going to kind of give some more colorful examples of really the things we talked about today already. So it's a lot of overlap, and I apologize, but hopefully just with a little bit of a different twist. And I'm going to start each issue or scenario with a quote. And this is one of my favorite quotes because it's by a very famous physiologist, Walter Cannon. He was actually responsible for um, coming up with the concept of homeostasis. And he said, time is an essential requirement for effective research. And you've all heard all of this this morning already from these investigators, right? You have to protect your time. There is a reason why these mentored research grants say you have to have 75% protected time. Because again, this is your opportunity to build the foundation to launch your career, to get the data, to write the publications, to get the grants. So it's critical and it's precious. But the, the reality is you might be at an institution where clinical demands are high. So you're going to love this. I started in July. I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist. Well, what if I told you that in the past year our cardiac surgery volume went up by 300%? That's not great for the new guy who's, in, who's the cardiac anesthesiologist, right? So, so what happened? Well, July started. You know, I've got my 75% protected time. I'm, I'm heading off to the lab, and I get a call from the charge anesthesiologist. Julie, ah, I know it's your lab day. Uh, we got to put a patient on an RVAD, and all the other cardiac guys are, are, are busy. Do you mind coming in and helping out? Well, at the time, you kind of feel great. Like, ah, oh, the bat signal went off. I get in my Batmobile. I head to the hospital. I save the day. We put the RVAD in. And guess what happened? At the end of the day, I realized I just lost a whole day. A whole day I could have been working on a grant, getting my lab up and running, and that just wasn't in my best interest. So what did I do? Well, I went to my chair, right? And we sat down, and I said, well, just there's some of the issues that were happening. And quite often, it wasn't happening a lot, but I didn't want it to turn into a trend. And she basically sat down and said, nope. If they take a day from you, you get that day back. You need this time. You need to be in the lab to make your career successful. Your chair should always be your advocate and make sure they are supportive of you. And you know, we talked also about a little of this this morning. 
we have to protect ourselves from non-clinical commitments too. And so, of course, in the beginning, you know, I'm getting emails, hey, can you teach this course? It's only two hours every other month. Can you be in this committee? We only meet once a month. And I'm a yes person, you know, I want to make everybody happy. Yeah, sure, yeah, yes, yes, sounds good, sounds good. And then all of a sudden I looked at my calendar, and like, where did all my time go, right? Monday I'm in the OR, Thursday we have lab meeting, and I'm trying to find time, again, to work on, on all these projects, so it became a little bit of an issue. All right, next example. I do research six days a week. I'm not sure how you're going to survive doing it only four days per week. That came, let's say, from a concerned citizen <laughs> who, was, who is a full-time researcher, okay? And then you can have the flip side, too. Someone said to me, well, that was a waste of eight years, and that was a full-time clinician referring to why even go to medical school and residency if you're going to be a 75% predicted time researcher? And, and, and it's hard hearing those things. I'm telling you right now. These people didn't mean anything malicious by this. It was, you know, it said, you know, you're in a conversation, you're talking, and it just comes out, and they're laughing, and you're laughing, and you're like, I, it's, not, it's not really funny at all. Um, because, you know, this is how it feels, right? And I want you to know it's going to happen to you, too, and you're going to feel that way, because you know how hard you're working, right? It, it, can be, it can be very hard to hear that. So in the beginning, I was trying to make everybody happy. I'm like, okay, I'm a researcher, I'm a physician, I'll be in with both groups, it's going to be great. But the truth is, the full-time researchers that I work with, they don't understand clinical duties, right? They don't know what it's like to take call, to go get called in at 2 in the morning and put somebody on ECMO, right? And the truth is, the full-time clinicians may not understand your research obligations. Some of them do, and some of them try to understand, but they don't know what it's like to come home you know, after working all day in the operating room, checking your emails, trying to work on a grant, manuscript review due, ugh, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. So one of the things I've done is I've taken opportunities to actually present my work to the department. And I don't mean giving a data talk, right? I love talking about data in my research. But I actually spend, you know, one time a year at our grand rounds and kind of talk to them about, hey, this is what I'm doing with all this time. And I was really surprised at the response that I got the next day, you know, from my colleagues. I didn't know you were doing that. That's really cool. It really helps. But at the end of the day, you also have to find your people, and my people are in this room, right? So you have to branch out. You have to network. That's where ESAS, I think, has been huge for me. It can be huge for you. That's my plug for ESAS. But it's true, right? You might be at an institution where there aren't a lot of physician scientists, right? And people don't understand the kind of issues you're dealing with. And you don't want to be isolated out on an island because next thing you know, you're going to have all these thoughts like, oh, I can't do this, and then you give up. And we don't want you to give up, right? It's very critical that you move on. So at the end of the day, I just kind of cross it out and say, you know what, I can make everybody happy. We try. Again, tell people what you're doing, explain your work, but at the end of the day, you have to just keep going. Okay, here's a good quote. I submitted the SF-424, but still need the FOA from the RFA. Something about indirect, something about cost sharing. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that came from my helpful budget person. So <laughs> see, we're all laughing because we all know, right? Um, this, uh, we have a, just a wonderful budget person in our department, and when I first started out, I was submitting all these grants, and I gotta, I gotta tell you, this is how I felt, okay? So this person didn't hit a hurdle, they just collapsed. It was actually a really sad story. And, and there were days in the beginning where I just wanted to collapse, because I'm like, I'm a science person. I'm not a budget finance person. I don't have an MDA. And they're giving me fi you know, budget reports, I'm like, oh, I'll do this, but we, we all know it's part of running a lab, right, or doing your research. And so it, it's, it can be hard. We have to be really good multitaskers. And after all that training, right, I showed you all the 14 years of training, sometimes I feel like I've really only just begun, and I have a lot left to learn. You have to be OK, obviously, juggling multiple things on a daily basis. One morning, I was driving to the hospital. Again, I'm a cardiac anesthesiologist. I got a big cardiac case going on. I'm pretty excited to do it. Residents nervous. It's their first cardiac case, which makes me nervous. Uh, and I'm driving to the hospital, and my phone alarm goes off because the negative 80 freezer in my laboratory is failing, and it has about 300 human heart samples in it. This is what happens, right? Well, I can't not go to the hospital and start my case, but the, the freezer is failing, so what do you do, right? And this is the kind of stress. I thought, well, do I drive to the hospital? Do I drive to the lab? Do I turn around and just go home and cry? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> But again, we have to be comfortable doing these things, and that's, that's OK. And speaking of being comfortable, I tell people, sometimes you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? I'm not a full-time researcher. 
I don't know a lot about budgets yet, right? And I have to figure these things out. But the same goes true, and this was brought up also by Kate Leslie just now, right? Sometimes when you're 75% protected research, you might feel a little uncomfortable doing your clinical duties. And I want to tell you right now, it's normal and it's okay. You're not going to lose your skills unless you're like never in the operating room, okay, or doing your clinical stuff. But especially in heart surgery, um, you know, in cardiac anesthesia, sometimes a week, even two weeks, hopefully not three, can go by when I'm not doing an echo, right? And I'm not taking someone on and off bypass. And then finally you're in that situation and it doesn't make you feel very comfortable. Um, sometimes we do have to rely on other people to help out. One morning I was starting an aortic dissection case. The resident couldn't get the art line. The fellow couldn't get the art line. Well, obviously I can get the art line. I couldn't get the art line. So I had to call one of my cardiac colleagues to come in the room, and boom, he got it right away. So how do you think that made me feel? I take off my surgical cap, I get all upset. I can't do this, right? I'm not in the OR every day. They do this all day, every day, and I can't keep up with this. And that's absolutely ridiculous, but it's, it's a way of thinking that can get you down. And one of the best pieces of advice I got from somebody was sometimes you have to live by what you know and not how you feel. At the time, I felt like I'm a bad physician. I can't do this. What, just because I couldn't get one art line? I know I've done an anesthesiology residency. I did the same cardiac fellowship that they've done. I've learned echocardiography. I can do this too. Yes, I'm not there every day, but, but I can hopefully deliver the same care. Okay, we all knew this was coming. Well, the data is not uninteresting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, reviewer number two. <laughs> okay. I, uh, I can't even take credit for this. This was a collaborator of mine, um, but we were working together on this project. It hurts, doesn't it? I mean, you know, you see this, and we were not laughing at the time, but we laugh about it now. You know, um, and that's how it feels, right? So, and we've all been there, and that's why everybody, again, laughs, because we've, we've all had this kind of critique. But the sooner you realize that rejection is just part of our jobs, and you could even say failure, right? I'm a lab person. Half the time experiments don't work. We submit publications, we get feedback, critiques, reviews, grants get triaged. It's just part of the process, right? But you just have to keep going. I always tell people that one of my biggest fears is the NIH budget for some reason. I just, I just always get worried about what's going to happen. Um, but I think it's because of what's shown here in this graph. So this is the NIH budget in billions of dollars from 1965 to 2010. And as you can see over time, the NIH budget, of course, has gone up. But we hit a huge spike in the NIH budget in the late 90s, and that's when I was thinking about going to graduate school. And of course, then I go to graduate school, the money is flowing, and then overnight, it was around 2004, as you can see, all of a sudden there was a dip. And it was, it made a huge impact. And overnight I saw labs shut down, you know, principal investigators who I thought were outstanding, you know, doing great work, and all of a sudden they're closing up shop and giving up. In fact, no one in my graduate school class went on to become principal investigators. We went to medical school, uh, went into teaching or industry. This is another sobering graph, right? So this is the NIH grant application success rate from 1978 to 2013. And yeah, there's highs and lows. But really, for the most part, you know what the trend is, right? This is incredibly difficult, what we do. And again, there's a lot of overlap. This was already said this morning, but we just have to keep trying. Okay, one of my personal favorites. Research medicine family. You can have two out of the three, but you can't have all three. And that was said to me around 2006. I remember it because that's when I decided to go to medical school. And I'm going to get real personal now. At the time, it didn't bother me. Uh, my husband was a busy trial attorney. I wanted to have this research medicine career. We had no intention of having children. We just weren't interested in doing it. And then 10 years later, in 2016, I became a geriatric mom. So I'm not trying to say here that having a child is like hitting a hurdle. It's one of the best things you can do. It's one of the best decisions I ever made. But what this person said stuck with me, obviously, for 10 years. Right? And at the time, when I found out I was going to be a mom, I thought, how am I going to do all this? Right? Uh, how am I going to be a researcher, be a physician, be someone's mom, be a wife? You know, can I do it all? And the answer is yes, you can. In fact, don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do these things. Right? It's just that life is one big balancing act, and I think we all know that. Right? And when I think of the life balancing act, I'm a physiologist, I think about the U-shaped curve. Right? And what I'm referring to is, is Walter Cannon's concept of homeostasis. Right? 
We're constantly trying to stay home in this sweet spot. Everything, we live in this, this physiological range. And you can put anything down here in quantity, with some exceptions, right? Heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, pH. You go outside, a little too much is bad. You go a little low, that's bad as well. We have to stay right here. And you can replace quantity with you know, anything, like clinical versus research time. And I gotta be honest, there's days where you know, I, my call is all clustered together. I'm in the operating room a lot. Inside, I don't feel so good because I know I need to be working on a grant or getting something submitted. Same goes true. There are days where I'm sitting in my office staring at the same AIMS page for hours, and I say, I've got to get out of here, and I need to go to the cardiac room and do a case, right? And you can also, of course, change this with work and family or work and life, right? Not to say that too much family time is bad. Well, sometimes it is. But, you know, <laughs> but we have to get our work done, too. And then, of course, if you find yourself working so much and inside, you have to listen to your body. If you're missing your spouse, your partner, your kids, just listen to yourself, pump the brakes, and come back home. So I don't know if you figured it out, but I showed a lot of images of people hitting hurdles here in this talk. But what I didn't tell you is that all of these falls happened during the Olympic Games. So all of these athletes, these are trained athletes who train for four years. They're experts in coming over obstacles and even they hit hurdles, and they fall, and it's absolutely devastating. And this is just to point out, and I guess I don't even need to say it because we talked about it this morning, right? You've heard from experts in our field saying they've hit hurdles, they've had obstacles. People are gonna pack up their equipment, you know, and, and do what they need to do, right? And that's why they're where they are, right? Because they, they hit these things head on and they were able to, able to overcome them. This is not all doom and gloom, right? If you keep working hard, you will achieve success Right? You'll get there, you'll get the paper published, you'll get the grant, you'll get the promotion, and you should celebrate it. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a great feeling, but the truth is all these feelings are temporary, and we need to go on to find our next challenge. Right? And whether that's your next project, your next grant, whatever it is, you have to go after it. So celebrate, enjoy it, but find your next challenge. So this is my last quote. The, world, the most rewarding things you do in life are often the ones that look like they cannot be done. And that, I've totally switched sports on you, actually came from Arnold Palmer. There are days when I get in the car and I drive home and I say, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like, why am I doing this? This is nuts. But I will, I'm totally honest, most days I get in the car and drive home and say, I can't believe I get to do this. When you think about the kind of job and career that we have, right, I get to go in the OR, do these cool cases, go to the lab, ask some questions, write some grants. It's, it's just the most rewarding and wonderful career you can have. And if you have kind of doubts about that, or you have days where you're like, what, what am I doing all this for? Just take a step back and look at the big picture. And that's kind of what I did when I put together this talk. I have a lab. I have an amazing research tech, Mary. She's a pleasure to work with. She keeps things going throughout the day when I'm not there. I have an outstanding mentor. Again, I hope I'm half the scientist that David Gutterman is. I have a supportive chair, right? She supports me, she protects my time. She's gonna give me a big raise. <laughs> All right, she didn't say that last part, that's fine. Um, I get to work with fun residents, right? When I'm in the operating room, they keep me on my toes, right? Because usually they're screwing up, no, it's fine. Uh, I, <laughs> I get to mentor, and we already talked about that this morning too. I get to mentor people. Kelsey Walters is a medical student in my lab. We're very fortunate to work with her. She's here actually presenting at this meeting, and it's just a lot of fun. Again, I get to meet cool people along the way, all the ESAS people, people who are doing what I'm doing, who know what the struggles are like. It's great. And I have wonderful clinical colleagues. Yeah, they don't understand what I'm doing most of the time in the lab, but that's okay. And, uh, and they're just a lot of fun to be with. And most importantly, at the end of the day, I get to come home and hang out with these guys. So I wish you all the success. I hope your, your, your papers get published. I hope you get your grants. I hope you get your promotions, whatever it is. Um, but at the end of the day, what I really wish for you is that you're surrounded by the people that all make it worthwhile. Thank you. making a game time decision. So we'll, I think we'll probably at the end of the talks do just more talking together, mingling time, and you, you're welcome to find the speakers and ask them questions about, uh, about whatever is on your mind. Um, 
I also want to invite people to get up and get coffee if that is something that is weighing heavily on your mind, the awkwardness of standing up and walking over there. Um, please, please, if that is a physiologic need that you need to restore some homeostasis, I think uh, now is a good time to take advantage of the short pause. Um, I'd like to introduce Ken Solt. He's an associate professor at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, where he actually did his residency, and so he's been hanging out there making fantastic and exciting discoveries into consciousness and the recovery of conscious behaviors, um, while also being a clinician and an awesome person in general. So <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Liz. Let me just pull up my talk here. So, um, so thanks, Liz. And um, I, you know, I think Julie gave a fantastic talk. Uh, I think uh, many of the take-home messages that um, she gave are going to be similar to what I have to say. Um, I must say I was a little taken aback when I was asked to give the senior investigator perspective. Uh, <laughs> I, I know I'm not junior anymore, but I, I don't quite think of myself as senior. So in a feeble attempt to uh, cling to the last vestiges of my youth, I'd like to call this a mid-career uh, investigator perspective. So. Uh, what I thought I would do is just share some of my personal uh, struggles that I encountered early in my um, career and to tell you how I dealt with those struggles and what I learned uh, through the process and what I've learned over the last few years um, being in this um, in this career. So um, to give sort of a similar kind of career timeline like what Julie did, um, so I was in medical school in the late 90s. Uh, I was actually uh, a chemistry major in college and so I um, I was, uh, once I went to medical school and I decided I wanted to be an anesthesiologist, I naturally became interested in anesthetic mechanisms. As a chemist, I was really fascinated by how is it that these drugs produce these profound effects that we use in the operating room every day. And so as a medical student, I did a few months um, of research uh, as an elective, and I really enjoyed it. And so I decided when I uh, started my residency in 2001 at MGH to pursue some uh, additional research there. So I did a six-month uh, CA3 research fellowship where I learned to, to do uh, electrophysiology at the cellular level to look at molecular mechanisms of anesthesia. I started to do patch clamping and things like that. And, um, and I enjoyed that very much, so I decided to stick with my mentor, and I, um, I was accepted to the uh, T32 program at our institution, and where I continued to sort of hone my skills in patch clamping and, um, and uh, molecular mechanisms. And then in 2006, I got my FAIR grant. This is the uh, picture that went up in the, in the FAIR um, announcement, and that's what I looked like uh, 12 years ago. <laughs> And um, so, you know, you, you look on paper, it looks like things are pretty smooth, right? Things, things were just kind of chugging along, and I was uh, you know, on a good trajectory. But um, what I'd like to do now is superimpose that on what was going on in my life. And um, so the, the, the life timeline is on the right. So uh, in 2001, when I was traveling in Japan, uh, I met my, um, my, my wife, who was my then-to-be wife, and a year later, we got married. And, um, I grew up in Japan, so I speak fluent Japanese, so I had no problem communicating with my wife, of course, but she didn't speak any English. And so at the time, I didn't really think much of it, but obviously, she, you know, she had to move to Boston, and when I was busy being a resident, she was taking English classes. And so, you know, things were going along just fine, and then, um, and then uh, three years later, right, as uh, I was sort of finished with residency and starting my, uh, my faculty position, uh, we had our first kid, uh, my son was born. And as the months went on, we started to notice that he wasn't quite meeting sort of the typical milestones. So he wasn't flipping over at the appropriate time and things like that. And so by the time he was about 15 months old and he wasn't walking, we were kind of getting concerned. And so we went to see a pediatric neurologist who said, ah, don't worry about it. You know, it's, you know, kid development. You know, everyone's a little different. Um, he's only 15 months. I wouldn't worry about it. And, um, you know, let's just follow up in a few months and see how things go, which is exactly what I wanted to hear, you know. And, but this is our first kid and we didn't really know what normal development looked like and you know we had a reassuring neurology workup so we were like okay um, but then when he was two years old we were starting to get worried again because he was finally walking but he wasn't talking and so when he was two and a half he was diagnosed with autism and um, at that time my wife was five months pregnant with our second child and was really kind of overwhelmed by this diagnosis and uh, a few months later of course my daughter was born and so 
at this point, you know, my life was really turned upside down. Our clinician said you have to immediately get your kid plugged into 30 hours a week minimum of behavioral therapy. You need PT, you need OT, you need speech therapy, you need a neuropsych eval, you need an MRI of the brain, you need uh, ophthalmology, audiology consults, you need a, uh, a genetics consult, and I'm probably forgetting a few. Um, but it was a lot. It was, and, and here I had a wife who didn't speak English. So, you know, I basically had to deal with all that myself. And um, it, was, it was hard. It was hard to go to work because I wasn't really getting work done. And so I ran into a colleague in the OR one day, and my colleague said, you know, Ken, you don't look so hot. You know, you're doing okay? And I was like, well, I'm actually, you know, kind of going through a tough time right now. And I told her what was going on, and she said, you know, you should really go talk to Warren Zapol, our, our department chair at the time. And it hadn't even occurred to me to go talk to my chair. Like, it was just one of these things. It was like, here's, you know, I'm just dealing with my problems, right? But I, uh, I decided to go talk to Warren, and um, I told him, look, you know, this is the situation I'm in. And he said, you know, how can I help you? And I said, well, you know, I think I just need to take, like, maybe a month or two to just sort of sort out my family issues. You know, I'm just trying to, I'm really struggling getting work done and sort of balancing work and family. And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, um, Ken, I would question you as a human being if you were trying to get work done right now. And this really kind of hit home. And he said, um, you know, right now you need to take care of your family. And he said, you know, in two months your wife's going to be seven months pregnant. Now, then what are you going to do? You're still going to be totally stressed out. And, you know, you need to, you know, go home, take care of your family, you know, go take six months off. And I was like, well, you know, I, I can't afford that. I, just, I, I can only take maybe one or two. And um, he said, look, we're lucky to have you. Your son's lucky to have you as a father. And, um, you know, you need to go take care of your family. And I don't want you stepping foot in this hospital for six months. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And I was like, okay. And I was overwhelmed. Um, but what I realized was that he understood what I was going through better than I was. Uh, because I soon found out a couple weeks later that, you know, we got my neuropsych eval and we found out that we were in the wrong town. So we were living in a town that had really bad autism services, and we were told that we needed to move. And so we got the diagnosis in November, and we moved to a different town in January. So we had to buy a new house, move into the new house, get him set up in the new school system. And um, I needed that time to just get through all that and to figure it out. And my wife was eight months pregnant when we moved. So, and it was winter in Boston, so it wasn't a fun time to move. <laughs> um, so amazingly, it all kind of fell into place at that point, but I needed that time. And, and my chair was extremely supportive and helped me through this. And one of the things that I learned through this process, and it seems so obvious, but you know, put your family first. When, when your family needs you, the work is irrelevant. You know, you gotta take care of your family before you take care of your work. You could have 10, 15 R01s, it doesn't matter. If your home life's falling apart, who cares? It's, it, it doesn't matter. And conversely, if you are struggling at work, who's gonna support you? It's gonna be your family, right? And if your family's falling apart, nothing's, nothing matters. And so, you know, people talk about balancing all these things, but if, if things are really falling apart at home, you gotta take care of that. And that's really something that seemed obvious, but even I at the time was, I was trying to figure out how to get work done, right? And so, it was one of these things where he just kind of crystallized for me that when these kind of things happen, you got to take care of your family. And so these are what my kids look like now. Um, my son's uh, 13, my daughter's 10. Um, unfortunately, my son remains severely autistic. He's nonverbal. He, you know, has severe limitations in both gross and fine motor skills. He can't talk. He, you know, can't even open a door. And not, I mean, you know, he's really struggling. So, you know, this wasn't a temporary problem. This is going to be a lifelong struggle for us. Um, but at a time when I really needed help, he, he supported me through it, and I learned a lot from that. And my daughter is you know, more or less neurotypical. That's sort of the new word for normal. Um, <laughs> and um, she, uh, you know, but she actually has ADD. And we were told that when you have an autistic kid, you have a 50% chance that your subsequent kids are gonna have a learning disability, and 10% chance that they have autism. So luckily she doesn't have autism, but that's the situation that, that we're in. Um, but what I really learned through this whole process is Really, the importance of communication, you know, the, the, and just being honest about what's going on in your life and not internalizing it. You know, talk to your mentor, talk to your chair about what's going on in your life. Don't just talk about science. You know, if, you're, if your life's falling apart, you got to talk to them about that and let them know. There may be help, um, you know, we're in places where you didn't even think they were there. And, you know, what my chair did for me may not be, you know, I mean, big disclaimer, this is my story, you know, everybody's different, everybody has different chairs, everyone has different stories, but everybody has their struggles. And, um, you know, I think 
as a specialty, we're really trained to absorb stress and internalize stress, right? And we were, we're taught to, you know, to tough it out. I mean, when I was an intern, there was no 80-hour work week. Max and I were actually interns together in the same hospital, so he knows what those ICU months were like, you know, Q3, 36-hour shifts. Um, it was tough, and the last thing you did was complain about it, and, you know, here we are, we're sleep deprived, we're not taking good care of ourselves, you know, we do so much to sacrifice our own lives for our patients. And so we're really sort of trained to not ask for help. And that's why I think early in residency we're taught, hey, when things aren't going well, ask for help. Because it's not an instinct that we have. It's something that actually goes against what we've been trained to do. Um, and I think, you know, along these lines, I just think that overall it's really important to have regular meetings with your mentor. You know, schedule regular meetings. Make sure those meetings happen. Make sure you guys are talking to each other and that you're on the same page and that you understand what's going on um, so that you know, if, if these things come up, that, that they're, on, you know, they're on your side. And so at this point, you know, I took six months off. I got my kids settled. I, was in move, I moved to a new town. I had my second child. Things were kind of getting settled. I came back to work, and then I kind of hit the, the next kind of crisis at this stage, which was that when I came back, my, my mentor uh, didn't have funding anymore. And so he had hit a funding gap during my uh, six-month uh, leave of absence. And um, I had a new chair as well, so similar to so Julie's story. So, um, so Warren was, had, had stepped down, and we had a new chair, Janine uh, Wiener Kronish, who was extremely supportive and uh, basically said, you know, if your mentor doesn't have an R, you're not going to get a K, and this is just the reality of the NIH. You need to start over and find a new mentor. So this was kind of overwhelming to me coming back from my leave. Suddenly I got to basically rethink everything that I've been doing. And, you know, I, I had some moments where I was like, maybe this just isn't worth it. Maybe I should just hang it up. And, you know, I didn't have a PhD, you probably saw in the first, you know, I, I had kind of gotten into research through a, a sort of a, you know, just based on interest, really, in my background. Um, I didn't have a, a ton of training, and I just felt like maybe this is, this is it for me, you know. But, um, Janine gave me time, and so when my fair grant ran out, she said, look, I know you've been productive, you know, you're, you're um, you know, a valuable member of this department, I know you're going to do well, so you know, I'm going to give you time to f you know, find a new mentor and figure out what you want to do next. And so um, I talked to some people in the department, and I uh, decided to start working with uh, a new mentor, um, Emery Brown. And the reason why I started working with him is because we had similar interests. So I was interested in anesthetic mechanisms, he was interested in anesthetic mechanisms, but I was sort of studying it from a molecular sort of approach and he was more interested in neural circuits and uh, systems neuroscience. These are things I knew nothing about. I have no background in neuroscience. I never did animal research. Um, you know, I had never written an IACUC protocol. I mean, this was all completely new to me. I had knew barely anything about EEG. Um, and so a colleague in my lab, uh, his name is Joe Cotton, he, uh, he was doing animal research in our lab. And so he basically kind of took me under his wing, put me on his animal protocol, and said, hey, you know, let's make this happen. And so he really kind of helped me to, to kind of get, get restarted and to, to take my research in a new direction. And um, so, you know, the, the things that I kind of took away from this is that you know, you want to choose your, your mentor wisely. Um, I think there are pros and cons of having relatively junior versus relatively senior um, mentors. Um, this is, for people who know this, is from Indiana Jones, where he has to pick which one is the uh, holy grail. And um, it turns out it's like the least ornate cup. It's that one in the middle. Um, so, you know, the flashiest may not be necessarily the best, um, but a good mentor will give you time, and I think that's really important. And sometimes, you know, the most senior, most, you know, people are really busy, you know, the rock stars. They're, they're, you know, sometimes they don't have enough time to give you when you're really junior. And so sometimes it's good to have two mentors, maybe somebody who's junior and somebody who's senior, so you can kind of get the best of both worlds. But, you know, ha have, think outside the box and sort of put together a team that works for you. Um, but you really want to make sure that you have a good relationship with your mentor, that you have somebody who understands understands your personal struggles, uh, who gives you plenty of time. Uh, someone who takes you to these meetings and introduces you to the colleagues in, the, in your field, the leaders who are, you know, you need to sort of, you know, they need to put a, a face to a name. That's sort of where we are, you know, in, in this stage of your career. And so, you know, you need somebody like that to kind of, you know, hold your hand and introduce you to people. And also somebody, and this is harder to assess early on, but somebody who will allow you to grow and become independent. And, you know, if if somebody has a track record of that, like people who've you know, gone on to become independent, that's usually a good sign. But these are sort of the things you want to think about. And I'm sure a lot of these themes have come up earlier today, and, and Julie touched upon some of these things I'm going to talk about. But, um, but these are the things that I think are really important. 
you know, I also was really daunted by the fact that I had to learn so many new things um, to sort of take my research in this new direction, you know, animal research, I could all this stuff that I didn't really know. But what I realized is that that's actually what you're supposed to because these are training grants you're applying for. And so, you know, the, the idea is that you really want to maximize your training. You know, take advantage of this period in your career. You know, take courses to fill the knowledge gaps, you know, the things that you don't know. Attend local research seminars. Visit other labs. If, the, you know, if you don't have things locally, you can... I spent a month on my K going to UC San Diego from Boston. I spent a month there to learn how to do visual discrimination tasks in, in rodents because nobody in my area was doing that. And so, you know, think outside the box. Again, think about, you know, ways to maximize your training. And, you know, if you're a PhD and you basically write a fair grant or a K saying, you know, I'm going to use this technique that I mastered when I was in graduate school, that's really not going to fly. I mean, you, you want to take this time and this opportunity to learn something new and to train in something new and really put together a good training plan. And so I think that that's something that's really important. Um, I know this has come up a lot, but time management is absolutely critical. Um, you know, I think that, you know, like what Ju Julie was saying earlier, there's this perception um, that you have all the time in the world because you're not in the OR. And just because you don't have to ask for a bathroom break, it doesn't mean you're not busy. You know, it's, it's really like, you know, you have other things going on. And so, you know, focus on things that are going to matter to you. You know, think about the cost-benefit ratio of everything you're being asked to do because you're going to be asked to do a lot. You know, when you, and, you know, it sounds obvious, right? Focus on original research papers. But what I mean by that is, you know, if somebody asks you to work with them on, you know, this huge review paper or some big, you know, book chapter that has to be written from scratch, you know, think twice about those kind of things because they're not really going to help you that much, you know, in the long term, you know, at least at this stage of your career, and they're going to be, a, it's going to take a lot of time out of your schedule. What you should really be focusing on is publishing, you know, working on your original research papers. You know, if someone invites you to do an editorial or something, you know, things that aren't as much time, then I would consider doing those things, but really, you know, balance your time, you know, be careful about how you budget your time, like what Julie was saying earlier. I think it's important also to balance time between your local commitments and national commitments, right? So especially at this stage, you're going to be asked to be on all these committees and teach courses and do all this kind of stuff. And you want to be a good citizen. I mean, I've, I've, you know, I've done committee work at my institution. I was on resident recruitment committee for five years, and I really enjoy that. But you know, once I was 10 years out of residency, I felt like I was a little bit out of touch, and it was a little hard for me to say what the resident experience was like 10 years out. And so I decided, you know, there's a point where you know you should probably pass those things on to other people so they get the opportunity to, to learn from those kind of experiences and you know to to sort of balance your time between those kind of things you know I'm on research council and I'm on promotion committee you know I'm on, I do things locally but I try not to get too many things local like IRBs, IACOOKs, you know you could go on and on and fill your time with all this local stuff but at the end of the day you know each of those things is valuable you'll learn from them but you really want to you know think about how much time am I going to commit to this and is it really worth it for me long term and those things tend to come to you. The national stuff, you tend to have to seek out. People aren't going to ask you to be on national committees. You often have to apply for those things, whether it's an IRS committee, ASA subcommittees, you know, things like that. Early on, I was told by uh, my chair, Warren Zapol, like, you know, it's good to get on ASA committees, you know, review abstracts, go to the meeting, meet people, and do that kind of stuff. After a few years of doing that, I ended up uh, getting on the uh, ASA Committee on Research, where we review fair grants and things like this. So, you know, it, all these experiences are really valuable, and I think that in some ways, they tend to be not as much work. It's kind of like focused work, but it's not something that it goes on and on and on, you know, month after month. And so you really want to kind of balance your time between those kind of things and, um, and seek out national sort of level committees and commitments, because I think those are important. Also, try to balance your time between things that are sort of high risk and low risk projects. The worst thing that can happen is that your two, three years go by and you don't have a paper. And so, you know, it's great to do things that are really cool and, and if it works out, fantastic. But, you know, when I think of a research project, there's really kind of two kinds of projects, right? One where no matter what happens, you can publish it, and one where it either works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't work, you're, you know, you, you don't have a result. And so, you know, it, those kind of projects tend to be higher impact when they work, but they also put you in a hole if they don't. And so you kind of want to have a diversified portfolio. It's just like stocks. You kind of want to have different levels of acuity of your projects to make sure that you at least have, you know, some production coming out of your lab. And even if they're not earth-shattering papers, at least you, you show productivity. Um, you know, this I'm sort of preaching to the choir, right? Network, go to meetings. I mean, you guys are already doing that, obviously. So, so this is great. But I can't stress how important this is, you know, to, to go to meetings, meet leaders in the field, put, have your face put to your name, you know, and, and it's, 
I know some people who are really, really like rock star researchers who don't like going to meetings and things like this, and they're just they're kind of shy, or, you know, for whatever reason. But it ends up hurting them in the long term because you got to remember that, you know, people who you meet at these meetings are going to be reviewing your papers, they're going to be reviewing your grants, they're going to be, they might invite you to give a talk at their institution one day. You know, maybe you'll need them to write a letter for you for promotion. I mean, these 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 relationships that you develop at these meetings are so important uh, over the long term that I really think that you know. And they don't happen at one meeting. You got to like keep doing it and keep you know um, developing these relationships. And if you're in a subspecialty, whether it's you know cardiac, ICU, OB, neuro, whatever, you know there's a society for all of these. So get involved in those societies. Get on those committees too, and really you know get involved at a national level. I think that's really important to to develop that that recognition. And I know Julie's going to hate this. I'm sorry. <laughs> If you're not from New England, you're probably going to hate me for this one. But anyway, um, I think building a team is very important. Um, you know, and it, it's kind of like what Julie was saying. You know, she found an expert who in microcirculation, and her. You know, find the experts that have these like unique strengths that your only your institution or maybe you know very few places have to offer, and try to combine those unique strengths with some question in anesthesiology to create some space, so a niche that, that you're sort of an expert in, and, and sort of take advantage of that. And when I say build a team, it's not only building a mentoring team to, you know, have different scientists from different departments and, you know, junior and senior mentors, you know, have a mentoring team, but also build your lab team, you know, people that you want to mentor, you know, people like grad students, medical students, and uh, residents, and undergrads, you know, these are people that, um, you know, are excited about the science and you know you want to take care of them and you want to be a good mentor to them too and I think that that's very important and um, and lastly you know as you sort of move forward in your career and you develop your science remember that you know you're you're sort of at an advantage and a disadvantage at the same time by being a clinician researcher your disadvantage is you don't have all your time to per, to put into research but the advantage you have is that you actually know what's clinically relevant and um, you know use that to to your benefit and when you're, you know, thinking about your science, um, you know, we're all trying to get funded to do, you know, to, to do the science that's relevant to the clinical realm. That's what NIH is all about. So, you know, consider, you know, the clinical relevance of what you're doing. Is this going to change the way we do things? I and mean, those are sort of the, th the big sort of higher level questions that you want to ask yourself when you're developing your own science. I also think it's important to be open-minded and you know, where, where you can, take some calculated risks and try things that might be kind of off the wall. You know, some, some things might work and you might be surprised. And so those are things that I think are important and, um, and also to have fun. If you're not having fun doing this, then you should probably be doing something else. I really think that, you know, it's just too much work and too much of a headache to not be having fun. And if the science doesn't motivate you and excite you, then you should probably find some other science or something else to do because it is a lot of work. And I'll have, I have to say that I'm having a lot of fun doing what I'm doing. And like Julie said, you know, we're all going to stumble. We're all going to fail at some point or another. But just remember that failure is success in progress. And with that, I just wanted to thank you for the invitation and um, happy to answer questions. Thanks. So that's um, that's the that's kind of the conclusion of the programming formally for the lunch session. But I hope you guys will um, will chat with the speakers. Uh, we have uh, another actually 20 minutes left in the session. Technically, our next programming starts at 2:15. Um, so please please use this time to network. All of our panelists have emphasized the importance of making connections. This is a room full of exciting potential connections. Um, so uh, certainly uh, hang out, have coffee, more coffee appropriately titrated, uh, and um, definitely be here at 2.15 for the continuation of the programming. Thanks. <laughs>